The New York Islanders get a big win over the Philadelphia Flyers, in part by correcting some of the things they struggled with during the losing streak. We'll break it all down for you. We've got our hero and go to the game, and we'll talk a little bit about what Islander fans have to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. We've got all that and more on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. Your Locked On Islanders, your daily podcast on the New York Islanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to the Thursday or Thanksgiving edition of the Locked On Islanders podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone for making Locked On Islanders your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you can get new episodes as soon as they drop. We've got a lot to get to on today's show. The Islanders with a big win over the Philadelphia Flyers. But first, if there's something Islanders related on your mind, if you have a question, a comment, maybe a topic you'd like us to talk about on a future episode, Just send us an email, the email address, LockedOnIslanders at gmail.com. And if you leave your first name and where you're from, we're happy to mention you on the show when we discuss whatever it is that's on your mind. You could also follow the show on Twitter at LockedOnIsles, and you could follow me, Gil Morton, on Twitter at IceWars, N-Y-R-V-S-N-Y-I. We'll keep you up to date on all things Islanders all season long. And I'm always live tweeting during every Islanders home and road game. So join me for some instant insight and analysis. And it's great to talk Isles hockey with viewers and listeners game time or any time. So definitely reach out and join us for that. Wow. Uh, Big game, big win. And I'll tell you why. A few reasons why I think this was a really good win for the New York Islanders. Uh, First of all, when you end a lengthy losing streak, you get a win. Getting a second win, getting that back-to-back win really makes it seem like you're putting that losing streak behind you. You know, if you lose seven in a row and then you win a shootout game and then you lose the, the next game, well, then you've still lost, you know, eight of nine and it's not so good and and the the negativity can return the fact that you come home and string two wins together in my mind was very very important for this New York Islanders team also very encouraging to get a win for Cal Clutterbuck uh in his 1000th game and congratulations again to Clutter uh for getting that uh win and he played for a little more than 15 minutes you know didn't figure in the scoring almost had an empty netter there toward the end but uh just overall uh, a solid game for Cal Clutterbuck and and a great accomplishment to play a thousand games in the National Hockey League Uh, And to do it as predominantly a third or most of his career, a fourth line player really shows a consistency. So again, uh, every day, as you know, we talked about this on yesterday's show, but congratulations to Cal Clutterbuck on 1000 games. Other things I really thought were important about this win is that the Islanders went out and corrected some of the things that they did struggled with during the losing streak. What do I mean? Well, first of all, let, let's start with the obvious. They held a lead. Uh, yeah, it was 3-1 with 17 and a half minutes roughly left in the third period. So, uh, and, and they did allow the Flyers to pull within one on that late goal by Joel Farabee. But, but they held on. And while obviously on social media there were a lot of uh oh here we go agains the fact is they led 2 to 1 after 40 minutes and held on in the third period and didn't go into a shell okay so i i i think that was important there and the other thing was 
any of us who were worried a little bit about Ilya Sorokin, I kind of expected Varlamov to play in this game. But now thinking about it, the fact that there's a back-to-back coming up Friday and Saturday, it made sense to have Sorokin go. You had a couple of days off in between. So I get it, okay? I get it. And the more important thing is, Ilya Sorokin did a great job in between the pipes for the New York Islanders. 33 saves, and especially in the first period, I'll say this. The Islanders led 1-0 after one period. And yet, even though the Islanders had, you know, more chances early in the game, the better quality chances belong to Philadelphia. But Sorokin came up big with the saves when he needed to, and the result was a victory for the Islanders. Another thing I really liked to see was the play of Adam Pellick. And we all know Pellick has been struggling recently, and it's been difficult to see him struggle that way. But two assists in this game, a plus two, blocked four shots, which tied him with Alexander Romanov for the team lead. And, you know, just a little more awareness in, in, in when to step up in the play. He did it effectively in this game, especially on the second Brock Nelson goal. And he was solid in his own zone for most of the game. So again, you know, the guys, the Islanders needed to play better are starting to play better. And I'm talking about, you know, Pellick. I am talking about uh, Ilya Sorokin. I'm even going to talk about Anders Lee. And again, I don't think Anders Lee was outstanding in this game, but it was his best game in a while. And yeah, that's a low bar. Not going to lie about that. But not only did he score a goal, he had five shots on goal two blocked shots. Anders Lee was noticeable in this game. And the other thing I liked about it was not just that he scored a goal and good for Oliver Wallstrom for assisting on it, but it was an Anders Lee goal. It was scored from just outside the blue paint and he just kind of whacked at it and poked it past uh, Carter Hart off either his skate or his pads. It was tough to see, but it was one of those dirty goals, as Jack Capuano used to say, uh, that the Islanders really need. That's what they need from Anders Lee. And he went out and did it. And, you know, if Anders Lee is a passenger, this team is in trouble. The fact that he was able to score that third goal, and now, you know, he's got a couple of goals in his last, what is it, three or four games. He's starting to wake up a little bit. Still a long way to go, but encouraging to see that. And then, obviously, the nelson engvall Palmieri line. Two goals for Brock on four shots. Two helpers for Pierre Engvall doing his thing, making a beautiful pass on one of those two goals. And then, you know, Palmieri doesn't figure in the scoring, but again, that line had chemistry, uh, and and that was good to see. And then here's another stat. Blocked shots by forwards in this game. We mentioned Anders Lee had two. Simon Holmstrom and J.G. Pajot had three blocked shots each. That's the kind of thing that you want to see from defensemen, uh, from forwards, especially bottom six forwards, where they're getting back and doing their thing and, and being involved defensively because the Islanders, you know, the Islanders can talk all they want about the importance of the defensemen getting involved in the rush when the time is right, and that helps. But having the forwards back check effectively is a big part of this team's success. It's something they haven't done consistently this season, and they did it better 
last night against the Flyers, and it's one of the reasons they won. All right, we have got more to get to. We're going to talk about some more key takeaways from this important win over the Flyers. Plus, uh, we'll have our hero and go to the game. And for our Islanders' birthday of the day, an enforcer who was only with the Islanders for 20 games in 2008-2009, but it's six foot seven. Uh, he's one of the bigger Islanders in the team's history. Let's see if you can guess who that is. We've got all that and more coming up on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. So another thing I really liked about this game, and, and there were a few. I mean, again, not a flawless performance, but an encouraging performance. And, and I'll add to it. Anytime you can beat the Philadelphia Flyers, that is even a little bit sweeter. When you have your division rivals, and especially, well, all of them really, but the Flyers and the Islanders have been rivals almost since day one. And, you know, by the time the Islanders made the playoffs the first time, the Flyers were one of the teams that, you know, were rivals of theirs and they played them in the semifinals and all of those important things, you know, throughout history. Okay, Rangers, Devils, Flyers, Penguins, Capitals, those are your biggest rivals. Uh, Carolina is sort of gaining, but it's more of a recent thing. But you beat Philadelphia, that's just a little sweeter if you're the New York Islanders. So you pick up two points in the standings. You're only two points behind Philadelphia now, uh, and you have a game in hand. It, you know, it's a four-point swing when you're in a divisional game, and to get that W really was uh, important at this point in the season. They did a good job overall of staying out of the penalty box. Uh, I mean, what what was it? You had one penalty in the second period by Oliver Wallstrom, and that was it. So you stay out of the penalty box. You don't take those lazy penalties. And by lazy penalties, I'm talking about, you know, you're beaten on a play and you hold or you hook or you trip or you interfere because you're not moving your skates. You know, when you take those kind of penalties, that's when you're in trouble. And the Islanders didn't do that against the Flyers. And yes, the Flyers had some cheap stuff that wasn't necessarily called, but the Islanders kept their cool. They did not let it bother them. And they end up skating away with the victory. And, you know, I'll take it a step further. Third period or late second period, I'm trying to remember. But toward the end of the game, Islanders ahead. I think it was early third period. and. You know, one of the Flyers roughs up Oliver Wallstrom and should have been a penalty, was not called. But to his credit, Wally just skates away. And, you know, maybe, you know, these two teams meet again Saturday. So maybe Wally gets his revenge then at the appropriate time with a hit or some kind of a message. But at the time when you're holding on to a third period lead, sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. And Wall Wallstrom did the right thing by skating away at that moment. And I give him credit for the way he handled the situation. So good job by Oliver Wallstrom in that situation. And yeah, I would have liked to see the Islanders stick up for each other a little bit more at times with some of the cheap stuff that the Flyers were going for. But you know what? The best revenge is getting two points in the standings and then the Flyers get none. And so I'm glad to see that. Uh, as far as our hero and our goat of the game, to me, uh, I'm going to give it to Brock Nelson. Two goals, a plus two, four shots, one six out of eight face-offs and you know, when your team wins three to two and Brock Nelson has two goals, uh, I think he deserves the hero of the game. Ilya Sorokin would be a close second, but to me, got to go with Brock. Brock and roll, baby, as Brock Nelson continues to be 
the most productive offensive player on the Islanders. Ten goals, first Islander to reach double digits. Pierre Engvall, by the way, nine assists. So uh, that's encouraging now as well. As far as a go to the game, I have to go with Matthew Barzal. And there was no player in this game that was really, really terrible. But Barzi only had two shots on goal. And he turned the puck over four times, according to the official stat sheet. And I know giveaways and takeaways in the NHL are kind of weird stats that, you know, you watch the game and and, and it doesn't always add up. But... The fact that he was credited with four giveaways in this contest, definitely a problem. And, you know, he skated a lot with the puck, but wasn't effective doing it. He was a minus one in the game. He had two penalty minutes, although obviously uh, when he took the penalty minutes, Garnett Hathaway went off with him. And Nicholas Delorier also went off. So the Islanders ended up with a power play. but. Uh, to me, Barzy, when we see good Barzy, you know, when he's on top of his game, he'll hold on to the puck, he'll skate with the puck, and it creates something. When we have bad Barzy, he'll hold on to the puck, he'll skate around, he'll dipsy do, he'll stick handle, and he'll turn the puck over. And the other team gets that odd man rush the other way or just gets the puck into the attack zone and and, you know, game over. So overall, this was not good Barzy that we saw in this game. Now, there were some times still when the Islanders were struggling to clear the puck out of their own zone. But, you know, it wasn't five or six minutes. It was more like two minutes at a time where, okay, we're having a little difficulty getting the puck out. But it was better but it still needs to improve overall if we're going to get there uh, where this team really wants to be. Oh, by the way, face-off circle. Uh, J.G. Pajot, 9 out of 16. Brock Nelson, 6 out of 8. K.C. Sezikis, 8 out of 11. So that was good. Bo Horvat lost 8 out of 18. He was below 500. But overall, Islanders solid in the face-off circle and – Again, those are the little things that a team like the Islanders needs to do if they're going to win hockey games. So to me, this is a step forward. And, you know, you held the lead. You played better defensively. The goaltending was grade A again. I mean, a 943 save percentage for Sorokin. Anders Lee contributes. The second line gives you two of the three goals. The forwards were back-checking better. I mean, Clutterbuck made a great back-check play at one point to break up a rush. That was a plus. The defense was still a little sloppy at times, but again, better. Overall, this is more of the formula we need to see from this team if they're going to get back on track and start winning. And now you've put two wins together. And let's face it, the next two games are both against teams that did not make the playoffs last year. Now, that's not to say that these are easy games, but Friday in Ottawa, Saturday back home against Philadelphia. uh, And then, you know, realistically, it's a four out of five games stretch with all division opponents. We just beat Philadelphia. We have Ottawa, and then it's Philly, Jersey, Carolina. These are important games. And hopefully the Islanders get back into their groove. Oh, and one more thing. Is J.G. Pajot snake bit or what? I mean, he just can't seem to hit the backside of a barn right now. He had some scoring chances, and that was encouraging. But still... Uh, 18 goal uh, games into the season. J.G. Pajot looking for that first goal. Uh, and that's got to be bothering him. I mean, yeah, Sebastian Ajo doesn't have a goal yet. Scott Mayfield, who missed, you know, a lot of games, eight games 
with injuries. He doesn't have a goal yet. Adam Pellick doesn't have a goal yet. But those are not guys who you're counting on to score a lot of goals. Whereas, you know, J.G. Pajot, while he's not going to be a 30-goal guy, uh, having zero goals in 18 games, not what you expect. So they got to get him back on track. And we will talk more about Pajot coming up. We've got more to get to on today's show. We're going to spend a little time talking about what Islander fans have to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. We'll have our Islanders birthday of the day. All that and more still to come on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. By the way, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. And yeah, you'll see Locked On NHL on there. Uh, and, you know, I do host the Monday show and co-host the Friday show. So look for us there. Uh, let, let's talk about Thanksgiving. It is one of my favorite holidays. I mean, food, family, and football can't go wrong with that. No hockey. Uh, NHL kind of takes the day off, which is fine. And everybody will be back in action on Friday and all good. No, no Islander game on Thanksgiving. Okay. But what do Islander fans have to be thankful for? And I, I've been thinking about it and there are a lot of things. Um, l- let's start with this. The history of this team, the four Stanley Cup the era between 1974 and 1985, let's say, that 11-year period when Al Arbor was the coach, when they went to the playoffs every year, went to the semifinals or the finals, four straight Stanley Cups, five straight Stanley Cup final appearances. Uh, All of those years were incredible. And you got to be thankful if you're old enough to remember them. And if not, you can watch a lot of those games on YouTube or on uh, NHL Network a lot of the time during the offseason. But those teams were so special. And, you know, when you've got a team that can – the the beautiful thing about Al Arbor's team, they find a way to beat you no matter how you did it. So if you wanted to play physical, they could get physical. Gordy Lane – uh, you know, could be physical. Uh, Dennis Potvan could get physical. They had guys, Clark Gillies, you didn't want to mess with him. They had guys who could play that way if the Flyers, uh, Broad Street Bullies were gooning it up. If you wanted to play high-flying 7-5 to five hockey, they could do that. They had so many goal scorers, Trottier, Bossy, Gillies, uh, so many guys who could put the the biscuit in the basket, as they say. Uh, they could beat you grinding it out. They, they they could win in so many ways. They had a clutch goalie in Billy Smith. And just to be able to watch those teams really is something that Islander fans should be thankful for. Got to be thankful for the UBS arena. I mean, let's face it. The Islanders now have a state-of-the-art rink. Uh, still not the ideal location. Uh, not as good as the Nassau Coliseum, but let's not get into all the political BS that derailed the uh, renovation or replacement of the Coliseum at the spot it was in. We have a great arena at UBS. You could take the train there now. You could take a car there now. Uh, You know, great food, great amenities, plenty of room in the hallway. No complaints. Very happy. And let's be thankful, in fact, that the Islanders stayed on Long Island. I mean, the move to Brooklyn by... Charles Wong was really designed to keep the team in town, even though it was less than ideal. So let's be thankful that the Islanders are still the only major league sports team on Long Island right now. And and, and that's a great thing. I am thankful for the goaltending of Ilya Sorokin and to be able to see an elite goalie right now on top of his game, in his prime, doing his thing game in and game out for the Islanders. I'm thankful for the identity line. You know, maybe it's not playing at peak performance right now, but 
you know, for the better part of a decade, except for those couple of years, Matt Martin was in Toronto. They've given us a lot. And I am very happy about that. I am happy about the community that I'm thankful for the community that the Islanders fan base is. It is enthusiastic. It is tight knit and it is great. And I, I also have to say, uh, I am I am thankful for the fact that this team has been in the playoffs for what is it now four of the last five years two long playoff runs I am still hoping to see a Stanley Cup again you know hasn't had one since 1983 in my lifetime I am hoping for that moment but you know the journey is still exciting. And yeah, it's heartbreaking at times, but we love this hockey team. And, you know, I am thankful for getting to see a guy like Matt Barzal do his thing and skate and, and you know, take your, your breath away with what he does. I'm thankful to watch a guy like Casey Sezikis give all out effort and kill a penalty. I'm happy and thankful for guys like Hudson Fashing, who paid his dues in the minor leagues for so long and is now getting a chance to play most of the time with the Islanders this year in the NHL. Uh, you know, you can love those blue collar underdog kind of stories and you can love guys like Matthew Barzal who are so skilled uh, and, and can do so much. I am thankful for Al Arbor and Bill Torrey and everything they brought to this franchise years ago. And I am thankful for you, the viewers and listeners of Locked On Islanders. I love doing this. I love this job and I love following and, you know, talking about Islanders hockey for a living and doing it every day. So I'm thankful to all of you for watching and listening and to the Locked On Podcast Network for this opportunity, which I am enjoying. And, uh, you know, thankful that my family will be together today on Thanksgiving. And, and yeah, these are these are things that we can all be thankful for. And before I get all mushed up and, and sentimental, let's go to our Islanders birthday of the day. And feel free to comment on anything else that you're thankful for on our YouTube page. Uh, Cause I'd love to hear from you. Well, we are uh, a day early, but Friday will be the uh, 43rd birthday of former Islanders forward, Mitch Fritz Fritz. Uh, from British Columbia, of Soyuz, British Columbia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Big guy, six foot seven, 242 pounds, undrafted, played in the ECHL, the AHL, but finally got his chance with the Islanders in 2008, 2009, played in 20 games with the Isles, did not record a goal or an assist, but he did have 42 penalty minutes and one of Mitch Fritz's better games with the Islanders November 22nd 2008 at the HSBC Arena in Buffalo Islanders with Joey McDonald in goal against Patrick Laleem in net for the Sabres and in this game Mitch Fritz dropping the gloves with Andrew Peters of Buffalo also picking up an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty so seven minutes in penalties for Mitch Fritz. He was on ice for two minutes and 16 seconds. But in the game, the Islanders got a goal and an assist from Andy Hilbert and Mark Streit. Two helpers by Doug Waite. And they beat the Buffalo Sabres by a score of four to two. We wish Mitch Fritz a very happy 43rd birthday. He is our Islanders birthday of the day. I want to thank everyone again for making Locked On Islanders your first listen every day. Every day is tomorrow on the show. We will preview both of this weekend's games, a rematch against the Flyers on Saturday. Before that, Ottawa. Uh, in Ottawa, so uh, two games that the Islanders have against teams they very well could be fighting for a playoff spot against. So important. We'll preview both of those games and have all the latest Islanders news notes and happenings for you coming up on tomorrow's show. Until then, happy Thanksgiving, everyone here in the United States. Have a great day. Stay safe. And of course, 
Let's go Islanders.